Welcome everyone to my PhD thesis presentation titled Training Sound Event Classifiers Using Different Types of Supervision. This thesis has been supervised by Javier Serra and Frederic Font and I'd like to thank the members of the board for being a part of this defense. So this thesis focuses on sound event classification which consists of the automatic identification of everyday sounds like a kettle whistle, dog barking or a fire alarm. And this has multiple applications in fields like healthcare, automatic description of multimedia, domestic assistance, or healthcare, to name a few. But this is a challenging endeavor due to reasons like the large diversity of sounds we'd like to recognize, or the large variety of patterns that source, sources of the same type can produce. When the work of this thesis started, the research context could be described in terms of the methods and data sets used at the time. As for the methods, uh, this was approached mainly using supervised learning with methods shifting from feature engineering to deep learning. And as for the data sets, most of them were all of limited size, often carefully annotated with vocabularies limited to specific domains. And so these data sets pose some limitations. Deep learning approaches typically require large amounts of data to show the potential. And each of these data sets alone encompasses a small bit of the variety of sounds we listen to every day. Therefore, these limitations were hindering the development of general purpose classifiers able to recognize tens or ideally hundreds of sound classes. At the same time, despite these needs, there were large amounts of data in repositories like FreeSound or YouTube, which have two main aspects in common. They host very large amounts of audio and they typically lack reliable homogeneous labels to describe this content. Instead, they have user provided metadata. In addition, this thesis was partially funded by the Audio Commons project, uh, one of the goals being the automatic description of sounds and uh, the exploitation of free sound for research purposes. So the question that we asked at the beginning of this uh, thesis was what can we do to allow the improvement of coverage and performance in sound classifiers? And we identified four research avenues corresponding to the four main chapters of this thesis. The most evident option to achieve this goal is to build better data sets, larger, and more comprehensive. Uh, and here, the repositories can be used as sources for data set creation. And this has been an important focus of this uh, thesis, where we build a new data set fully open with a large vocabulary and reliable labels. However, the amount of data that can be gathered this way is typically less than ideal. And therefore, techniques to improve generalization to new examples are typically paramount. Uh, so here we also implemented methods to improve generalization through architectural modifications and also data augmentation. So far, we've assumed that the labels are always correct, uh, but this is certainly not always the case. In recent years, we've seen a transition to larger data sets with less precise labeling and also attempting alternative is to train classifiers directly based on these web repositories where the labels can be inferred automatically, for example, uh, from the user provided metadata, which leads to label noise as well. So sometimes the supervision given by noisy labels is the only choice, and therefore this is a pressing issue for sound classification. Consequently, uh, this has been an important topic as well. Our contributions include a data set to support this research and techniques to mitigate the effect of label noise. And finally, uh, so far we assume that textual labels are always available. But this is, again, certainly not always the case. In fact, unlabeled data is much more abundant. And one way to exploit this data is through self-supervised learning, where we learn representations without human supervision. And then these representations can be used for downstream tasks. Here, we have significantly contributed to this direction by the development of strategies to learn audio representations from unlabeled data. And so in this thesis, we've done research on several strands of data set creation, as well as supervised and unsupervised learning to train large vocabulary sound event classifiers. Specifically, the objectives of this thesis are to build a new data set of sound events, larger in coverage and size, to devise a learning method to improve generalization, to develop techniques to mitigate the effect of label noise, to develop the methodologies for learning representations from unlabeled data and to release data and code as open resources. 
Um, this is the outline of this presentation along with the corresponding chapter of the thesis. Uh, after this introduction, we'll see four sections corresponding to the main four objectives I just presented. And then we'll briefly mention our work on the case challenge organization and the summary and conclusions of this thesis. So let's get started with the free zone dataset 50k, although I'll sometimes refer to it as FSD for simplicity. Um, this content has been published in transactions on audio, speech and language processing and an Ismir paper. So first of all, why are we doing this? Uh, as mentioned, most existing data sets were small or domain specific, except audio set, which is very large and diverse, but in our opinion, uh, suffers from openness and stability issues. And so our field lags behind in terms of data set availability compared to other fields. Um, the starting point for the creation of our data set is a source of audio content, a vocabulary to annotate this content, and then an infra infrastructure where to load these resources and gather annotations. These are FreeSound, Audio Set Ontology, and the FreeSound Annotator. FreeSound is a sound sharing site with over half a million clips covering a wide variety of audio content. Importantly, this content has user provided tags that we'll use uh, to, the, to the creation of our data set. Then Audio Set Ontology is a hierarchy of over 600 classes. Each class has a textual description, which we also use to create our data set. And it is one of the most comprehensive set, sets of everyday sounds, in academia at least, um, which is convenient for uh, the diversity of prison. And finally, the FreeSound Annotator is a website for the collaborative creation of data sets based on FreeSound, featuring tools for exploration, annotation, and monitoring of data sets. This is a project mainly developed by Javier Favori with contributions of myself. So we started the creation of this data set uh, by automatically populating classes in the ontology with FreeSound clips. And this is done in two steps. First, we compile a list of keywords for every class. These keywords are terms that are typically used by uh, FreeSound users when describing audio content through tags. And then every class is populated with the corresponding clips. That is the clips that uh, contain one or more of these keywords among their tags. The outcome of this process is over 200,000 clips with uh, automatically generated candidate uh, labels. Next, we validate these candidate labels manually. For this, we use an annotation tool with two phases for every class. First, we have a training phase so that the annotators get familiar with the class by showing the description examples and more. And then we have a validation phase where they evaluate uh, the presence of the given class. So we run first an internal quality assessment with an initial prototype of this tool in order to get feedback for improvement. Uh, as a result, we added important features to this tool. For example, the inclusion of frequently asked questions to mitigate the ambiguity of some of these audio descriptions and other important uh, features that you can see in the slide. Um, then with the final prototype, we run an annotation campaign where we divided the classes according to the level of difficulty. Here we decided to gather annotations both through crowdsourcing and hire annotators. And overall, uh, almost 400 people participated, including six hired annotators uh, closely trained and monitored by the authors of this publication. As a result, uh, we gathered over 50,000 clips with present labels. Now, we wanted to split the data into development and evaluation, and we came up with a number of criteria for this split. First, non-divisibility of uploaders. Uh, FreeSound is composed of audio provided by users, so we wanted to preserve uh, all the content of every user, either in evaluation or development, to avoid potential contamination. Then, these uploaders can be small or large, depending on whether they contribute with a few clips or hundreds of them. So we wanted to keep the small ones for evaluation for a higher diversity. Given these constraints and others, uh, we came up with a procedure where we first sort the uploaders by size and diversity, and then we progressively allocate this content to the evaluation set until a target amount of data is reached. As a result, we have two candidate subsets is joined in terms of uploaders. Now, due to the validation of these candidate levels proposed by a simple nomination system, 
the labels that we have are mostly correct but potentially incomplete, which is a problem for evaluation. And so we, de we decided to refine the evaluation set so that we have an exhaustive labeling here. Now, this is a very complex task because we have hundreds of classes. And so we turn to our pool of hired annotators as they have a very deep understanding of the ontology. And also we use a new interface for the exploration of this large vocabulary. Here we again have, has, we, we have uh, two uh, phases. After a training phase, we have a refinement phase where we first review existing labels, modify any if needed, and then we add potential missing labels. This tool allows the comparison of different depths level, level, levels of the ontology and different classes, which proved very useful. So after this process, we have a candidate development set with correct but potentially incomplete labels and a candidate evaluation set which has been exhaustively labeled. I'd like to thank our hired annotators for their hard work on this very laborious task. I know it pretty well because I spent quite a lot of time annotating too. Also, big thanks to my collaborators, Javier Fabri and Jordi Pons. And the final stage is post-processing where we shape the data into the final version of the data set. This was very laborious too, and to be honest, a bit boring. So I'll just mention the main tasks here. We narrowed down uh, the vocabulary to 200 classes. Uh, then we balanced development and evaluation sets. We proposed to split development into train and validation. Uh, here, we wanted to keep the non-divisibility of users too, but it was not possible due to a number of constraints. And so we distinguish between two types of contamination, and this is important, we'll see later on. Uh, within class contamination in red, where content of the same uploader and the same class is at both sides of the split. And in blue, between class contamination, where content of the same uploader, but not from the same class, is at both sides. So we hypothesize within class is the most problematic case, and we minimize it here. And finally, we propagate the labels hierarchically. As a result, we have a very nice data set of over 50,000 clips, 100 hours of audio, annotated with 200 classes from the artist ontology, covering human sounds, sounds of things, animals, and more. You can see there the train validation and evaluation split. The data set is released with a number of metadata resources and under Creative Commons licenses. As any other data set, the FSD has limitations too. Uh, we use the refinement task to quantify the level of label noise after the validation task. As a result, 94% of the labels were verified as correct, and about half the clips needed additional labels that were provided in, the, in this refinement step. The data set is imbalanced. Um, some classes in the development set might show some data biases, and the vocabulary is not very specific in some parts. One of the experiments that we run with this data set is uh, about comparing different train validation splits. We considered three splits, as you can see in the slide. All of, the, all of these three sets have a similar size. The main difference between them is the uploaders shared between train and validation. As you can see, the first two approaches suffer from within class and between class contamination. Ours is based on minimizing within class. And here you see the results. You see uh, the uh, learning curves for training, validation, and evaluation with the different uh, train validation splits. Uh, when we ignore within class contamination, the validation performance in light blue is overly optimistic. However, when we minimize this type, it is a good proxy for evaluation, which is what we want. So as a summary of this uh, section, we've proposed uh, the, a methodology for data set creation based on human validation of nominated candidate levels, followed by a refinement process where we approach a complete audio transcription. We've gathered annotations through crowdsourcing and trained annotators, and we've put special emphasis on the evaluation set, which to our knowledge is unprecedented. This data set has achieved several milestone, milestones. It is the largest fully open data set of human labeled sound events. The paper introducing this data set is the first one to appear in the data set paper section of the challenges and data collection committee website. And it has enabled six audio challenges, seven data sets, and it's been used for research beyond sound classification. We now continue with 
uh, improving generalization by increasing shifting variance in CNNs. This content has been published in, it's currently under review in signal processing letters. So CNNs have been and still are one of the corner stores of sound classification. One of the reasons why is the commonly assumed properties of uh, CNNs is uh, shifting variance by which output predictions are supposed to be not affected by small shifts at the input. However, recent works in computer vision and cover that is, this is not always the case. And in fact, some shifts can change networks predictions substantially. So we ask whether this is a problem in sound classification. And to answer this question, we apply shifts to input patches, and then we analyze the network's robustness against these shifts. We do this through classification consistency that measures the number of cases where the network predicts the same class for both the original and the shifted patch. And here you can see that when we apply a time shift of one frame, meaning 10 milliseconds in our experiments, the top prediction provided by a VGG network changes 18% of the time, which is quite a lot. As time shifts increase, things get a bit worse. And when we do frequency shifts, things get even worse. So it seems there is a problem here. Um, the literature shows that one of the causes of this lack of shift invariance is wrongly executed subsampling operations that don't meet the classic sampling theorem. And these operations are prevalent in CNNs. So among the techniques to improve these uh, operations in CNNs, there are two main trends, one based on low pass filtering solutions and the other one based on architectural changes. So here, we evaluate mechanisms to improve shift invariance in subsampling operations in max pooling layers, which are one of the main blocks in, in CNNs. Specifically, a max pooling layer uh, can be decomposed into operations, the sequence of a unit stride max pooling operation, followed by a subsampling operation with a given stride. So here we evaluate the inclusion of a low pass filter before subsampling and the substitution of naive subsampling by a more sophisticated strategy. So a bit more details. Uh, here you're looking at a two by two max pooling operation that we usually uh, use. And as I said, it can be decomposed into two smaller operations. Here we in include this low pass filter before subsampling through another convolution operation. Now these low pass filters can be realized in different ways. Uh, previous work proposes to implement them as fixed binomial kernels called blur pool. Here we compare them to trainable kernels where we initialize them randomly, we learn them through back propagation, and the low pass uh, nature is imprinted through a softmax function that ensures uh, non negativity and normalization. Then, adaptive polyphase sampling is a down sampling mechanism that directly addresses the lack of shift invariance in these operations. And the underlying principle is simple. Uh, the idea is, as you can see in the slide, uh, when you subsample a patch and it's shifted by one beam version, you are likely to get different results when you sample beams at the same positions. However, when we subsample feature maps, instead of always using the same grid, uh, multiple could actually be used. Specifically, if we consider a subsampling operation with stride two, there are four possible grids that could be used for this purpose leading to four possible candidate feature maps. And so one way to gain robustness against this shift is by adaptively selecting the subsampling grid uh, by maximizing some criterion, for example, the output energy. As you can see in the bottom figure, uh, in this way, the grid follows the shift at the input to some extent. And so uh, these operations gain some robustness to shifts. We evaluate these uh, mechanisms on the FSD 50K dataset. As a baseline model, we use a VGG type of architecture for a number of reasons. Uh, this um, uh, model includes several max pooling layers that will be substituted by our proposed mechanisms to see their effect. And then the, the best setups will be evaluated with a larger model VGG 42. So first we report results with a small model. All methods outperform the baseline system. If we focus on the low pass filtering based solutions, we see that this signal processing technique is, is helpful. While it may seem that uh, blurring feature maps can lead to loss of information, our results show that is, it is indeed helpful. As for the choice, trainable versus non-trainable, 
it doesn't seem critical, yet the trainable version seems to work a little bit better. These are our top methods, which work on par. And when we combine them, uh, we, we see a small performance boost. Here we are low pass filtering the incoming feature map, uh, followed by subsampling with APS. Now we take the best setups in the small model and we evaluate them at a mixup and a larger capacity network. Uh, the motivation for using mixup is twofold. First, we want to improve generalization and mixup is well aligned with our task. Uh, and then we want to evaluate um, these mechanism, mechanisms in presence of a strong regularizer. The idea here is that if they act mainly as a form of regularization, we would expect them to provide the limited boosts when combined with mixup. Uh, by seeing the results, uh, we do observe certain performance decrease, but the boosts with respect to the baseline are still solid enough, suggesting that these methods are addressing problems beyond lack of regularization. When we use these methods with a larger model, uh, we see that they are still beneficial under more competitive conditions. And finally, we substitute the trainable Lopas filter by its analogous fixed version in our best setup. And we, we see again that the performance differences are not large, yet the trainable version seems to work slightly better. Uh, the left side of the figure illustrates an example of a fixed low pass filter as proposed in the previous work. The right side uh, shows a collection of trainable low pass filters after convergence. Here you can see that multiple filters are learned with different patterns. And to finish this section, we um, go back to the table that we saw at the beginning analyzing the network's robustness against the shifts. Here we see that the proposed approach shows higher robustness by showing higher classification consistency in all cases. And here we, we, we show a couple of examples. First, we apply a time shift of up to five bands over a water dripping sound. The right plot shows that uh, when we apply uh, our mechanisms in blue, the predictions for the top class drip in this case are pretty stable. Without them, they show some fluctuations. Also, here we apply a frequency shift over a computer keyword sound. Um, again, the uh, predictions with our mechanisms are more robust than without them. Our um, best system outperforms, obtains state of the art on FSD 50K, outperforming previous approaches based on a collection of training techniques and transformers. So the takeaway here, the main one is that we've seen, we've, we've seen that the models evaluated present a problem of only partial shift invariance. And by inserting our pooling methods into these models, we obtain higher robustness to shifts and recognition boosts. Uh, we are now adding these models to the Sensia TensorFlow ecosystem so that they can, uh, easily, they can be easily used by the community. And now we continue with training sound event classifiers with noisy labels. This content has been published in ICASP, WASPA, and a signal processing letter done during an internship at Google. So as mentioned, uh, label noise is a problem for sound event classification that causes nasty effects on the learning of classifiers. And one of our contributions is the FSD Noisy 18K dataset, uh, uh, which to our knowledge is the first one to provide for the investigation of label noise. You're looking at the, the amount of data per class um, with a small amount of manually created labels in, in yellow and a large amount of noisy labels. But how did we get to this? We started in a similar way to FSD 50K from Freesound and audio set. The first stage is the same. We automatically populate classes with uh, free sound clips. This leads, uh, to an, leads us to a number of candidate clips per class, a small portion of which was human validated. And from here, we, we, we obtain a clean train set and a test set. The remaining, the remaining clips have no human validation, and the only supervision is provided by the, the user provided tags in free sound. And so there's some kind of label noise here and we wanted to characterize this label noise. So we went through a small portion of the data set manually inspecting the different cases. And these are the results. We obtained that uh, about 40% of the labels are correct and complete. And as you can see in red, the main type of label noise is out of vocabulary. 
And these are the main aspects of the data set. We've gone already through some of them. It's worth mentioning that the proportion of the noisy train set and clean train set is 90%, 10%. We'll use this later on. The first um, methods that we evaluate to uh, mitigate the effect of label noise are noise or bus loss functions. Here, the typical loss function for multi-class problems is uh, categoric agrocentropy, CCE, where we compare tar uh, target labels and predictions. However, this uh, label noise is sensitive, sorry, this loss function is sensitive to label noise as it puts more emphasis on difficult examples. The thing here is, um, the examples for which the predictions differ more from the label are also weighed more in the gradient update, as you can see uh, in, the, in the plot. This is due to the logarithm operation. This is okay for clean data, that's what we want, but for uh, noisy data, it can be problematic. And so we discuss a few alternatives. Here we'll just mention uh, one. Uh, this is the generalized cross entropy loss, and the intuition is as, follow, as follows. We've seen that CCE is sensitive to noisy labels. An alternative is to use mean absolute error. My, here we treat all samples equally and that gives some noise robustness. But in practice, this is not a very nice loss for training classifiers, uh, at least in our experiments. So to take advantage of the benefits of both functions, the generalized uh, cross entropy loss is a generalization of both expressions. It, it, it is given by this expression in, in the slide where when q equals one, this reduces to my, and when, when q tends to zero, it can be shown that this is equivalent to CCE. And so the q value regulates the amount of noise robustness, as you can see in the plot in green, in red, green, and blue, compared to the black curve of uh, CCE loss. And here you see some results. You're looking at um, uh, the, the classification accuracy when training with different subsets of the data and different loss functions. You see that training with the noisy set outperforms training with the clean set, but at the expense of using 10 times more data. Then we also see that the robust uh, functions evaluated are, are well aligned with our task, especially the, the generalized cross entropy loss. And finally, we see that when we swap CCE by um, the generalized cross entropy loss, we obtain a 2% boost. If, on the other hand, we add two and a half hours of manually curated data, we have a 5% boost, but swapping loss functions is very cheap and curating this data is a significant effort. Another strategy that we evaluate to be robust against noisy labels is what we call loss-based instance selection. And this is based on, on the idea that when we learn from noisy labels, we, we first tend to learn easy and general patterns in the data before memorizing the noise. And this motivates us to show this, to see this, this learning process as a two-stage process. First, we train with a noise robust loss function, even though the label noise shouldn't be a, a critical problem at the, very, at the very beginning, we don't know when noise starts kicking in, so we want to be on the safe side. Then, after a number of epochs, the model has converted to some extent, and then we use it for instance selection. The idea here is that we identify large loss instances and we ignore them for the gradient update. And we do this in two different ways. Uh, the first approach is to discard these instances uh, from every batch at every iteration. And this is based on a time-dependent loss function that exhibits a, a change of behavior as learning progresses. And the other approach is about pruning the data set. Here we use the current state of the model to predict in the entire data set. We obtain loss values and then we, re we reject these large loss instances before continue the learning process. Here, as the model plays an important role as an instance selector, we, we evaluate with two models, a baseline and a more competitive model. The main result here is that pruning the data set seems to work slightly better, but the differences are very small. And pruning the data set it seems to be a bit more stable, perhaps because we are considering a loss distribution of the entire data set instead of tiny loss distributions of, of uh, batches of data. Now, so far, the label noise mitigation techniques that we've seen address generic problems, but not specific patterns of label noise. And here we focus on missing labels, which is uh, an important problem in, in large sound event data sets and audio sets specifically. So the goal here is to improve performance in presence of missing labels. 
audio set creation is very it's sort of similar conceptually to the uh, creation of fsd 50k and here this nomination and validation processes can fail meaning that we can have missing labels specifically for audio set the labels can be explicit if they received human validation or implicit negative if they haven't and this is the vast majority of the labels so it's likely that some of these implicit negative labels are in fact missing present labels audio set is a multi-level problem we typically use binary cross entropy for this and these implicit negative labels are covered by this second term so the thing here is that when a sound event is present, uh, the model will produce a high score, and this behavior will be penalized with the backpropagation of an artificially high loss, and this can be a problem. So to address this issue, we propose a teacher-student framework where we first detect potential missing labels per class, and then we ignore them uh, in the learning process. So we first, train, we first train a teacher model using the original labels, and then we predict scores on the train set, these scores will be used for taking decisions on labels veracity. Specifically, we focus on the implicit negatives and we hypothesize that the top scored negatives are in fact missing labels. And therefore, we create this new enhanced label set, flagging a certain amount of these top score negatives in order to ignore them in the second stage, which is training a student using this new label set and a loss masking approach. So here we compute a binary mask using the information of this new label set and we ignore the contributions of these top score negatives above a certain threshold TC. Basically, we compute this mask and apply it to the negative term of the, of the loss function. In these experiments, we uh, use two train sets with a similar class distribution, but different proportion, as you can see in the table, and two models of different capacity. Basically, we uh, train a ResNet 50 teacher, and then based on these teacher scores, we generate 80 new label set, sets, each of these with a different threshold, and for each of these, we train a student model and report evaluation. So you're looking at the impact of missing labels um, as a function of the top score negatives discarded, uh, D prime in the top, lower up in the bottom, and the amount of negative discarded goes from 0% in the left, meaning normal training, a baseline, to 20%. And we do this for the two train sets and the two models. Now, a lot of information can be extracted from these uh, plots, but we only mentioned the main ones here. The method yields boosts in all cases. This is irrelevant already because audio set training examples are typically treated as if they were completely labeled. The most important pattern that we see here is this steep increase at the beginning, meaning that uh, most of the boost com comes from removing just a tiny portion of the labels. And the boosts are higher when the train set is smaller, but these labeling errors are still observable with massive amounts of data. As a summary of this section, we've proposed FSD Noise 18K to support label noise research with a characterization of label noise We've seen that large amounts of free sound and the supervision by tax is feasible for training classifiers. And then we've evaluated a number of simple model agnostic approaches to improve performance in this scenario. We've seen that noise robust loss functions is effective in mitigating label noise, that rejection noisy samples during training is a bit more effective. And then we've addressed the problem of missing labels which is a pathology in audio set. And we see that the boosts are higher with reducing the, the train set, but we still see these things when very large amounts of audio. We now continue with uh, self-supervised learning of sound event representations. This content has been published in ICASP in a paper done in collaboration with folks at Dublin City University and also at WASPA in another internship at uh, Google Research. So, as mentioned, it is very common that we have few manually labeled data, but abundant unlabeled data. And a way to exploit this uh, data is through self-supervised learning, where we learn mappings from inputs to low dimensional representations. And then we use them for classification in our case. Specifically, we focus on contrastive learning, which is essentially learning by comparing. So we compare pairs of examples, pairs of positives and pairs of negatives. And the goal here is to uh, get this 
sem semantically structured embedding space where the representations of the similar examples are close together and the dissimilar examples are further away. Now, the key thing here is how we design these proxy tasks. And there are typically two main questions here. How to generate pairs of positives and then how to compare them. In our first approach, we generate them with composition of data augmentation methods, and then we use a similarity maximization. And this is our proposed approach. It is based on the same clear uh, framework in computer vision, where we essentially maximize the similarity between differently augmented views of sound events. We first apply what we call temporal proximity sampling. We sample two patches randomly with the same clip. This is a form of, the, of data augmentation. And then we add mix back, which is basically mixing the incoming patches with unrelated backgrounds. Here we are reducing the mutual information between these patches while retaining the semantics through, through sound transparency. And then we add some more uh, data augmentation methods. We choose them so that they are very simple and we can compute them on the fly. As you can see in the slide, each of these methods um, have one or more parameters that need to be tuned. And then we extract low dimensional embeddings H using an encoder, and we map them to the final metric embedding Z where we apply the loss function. This contrastive loss uh, is uh, essentially doing as follows. In the numerator, we have the similarity of ZI and ZJ, that correspond to the embeddings associated to differently augmented views of the same input example. And this is maximized. And then in the denominator, what we have here is the similarity of all possible negative pairs uh, drawn from the batch of samples, and this is minimized. And so by solving this task, hopefully useful representations uh, can emerge. We evaluate this using the FSD Noise 18K dataset in two stages. First, and supervised learning, where we train in a noisy set and validate on the clean set with K and N evaluation. And then we evaluate the learned representations with supervised tasks, uh, specifically with uh, fine tuning our model after initializing with pre trained weights. Here we use the two downstream tasks enabled by this data set training on the noisy set or training on the clean set. Some results for the ablation study. For temporal proximity sampling, we see that the best uh, case is sampling at random, and the worst case is when we use exactly the same patch. Um, when we use mixback, we see that lightly mixing the incoming patches with unrelated backgrounds helps, and also adjusting the energy so that the foreground is always dominant over the background is also uh, helpful. Then we explore data augmentations individually. Uh, we see that random resize cropping and spec augment are the top performing methods. And then we explore a number of combinations, non exhaustively because it's this, this is very expensive, and we improve uh, the results a little bit. And then we evaluate the representations. We first report the supervised baselines trained from scratch. The main thing here is that the ResNet architecture works worse than the others, potentially due to the large capacity overfitting not a lot of data and noisy labels. And then with model fine tuning, we aim to measure the benefit of unsupervised pre-training with respect to training from scratch in these two scenarios that I mentioned. As you can see, unsupervised contrastive pre-training is best in all cases. It's worth mentioning that the ResNet used to be the worst one uh, when trained from scratch, potentially limited by data or label quality. Now, with unsupervised pre-training, it uh, uh, reaches the top accuracy, but presumably because these problems are being alleviated. The takeaways of this section uh, is that we, we've obtained a successful representation learning by tuning patch sampling, mix back, and data augmentation. And through experiments, we've seen that unsupervised contrastive pre-training can mitigate the impact of data scarcity and increase robustness against noisy labels. Now, for our next framework, we recap on the two main questions that we saw before. The first one is how to generate pairs of positives. Um, typically, we, we see that uh, some people uh, do this with composition of data augmentation methods. We did it as well using methods like those in the slide. Um, these transformations are mostly artificial and handcrafted with one or more parameters that can be tuned, which is sometimes very painful. 
Uh, also, when we combine many of these things together, we risk introducing unrealistic domain shifts. On the other hand, sound scenes are time varying collections of sound events, and the association of these sound events with the mixture and each other is semantically constrained. So, with this motivation, we propose to use sound separation to generate uh, views for contrastive learning. Specifically, we decompose a mixture into multiple separated channels that share semantics with the mixture and each other. Compared to previous approaches, sound separation is an input dependent process and reduces the need for parameter tuning as long as you have a separation model. Specifically, we compare the mixture with one of the separated channels and this should meet the recommended guidelines for contrastive learning. Here, the mutual information between views is reduced as there are some components in the mixture that are no longer in the channel. Also, some relevant information is preserved as whatever is in the channel is also in the mixture. Now, the second question was how to compare pairs of examples. In addition to similarity maximization, another popular task is coincidence prediction, where we predict whether a pair of examples occur within the, tem the same temporal proximity, typically a few seconds of the same click. Here, we propose to optimize them jointly. We argue that they help each other because they share the same goal, a semantically structured embedding space, but they pursue this goal in a slightly different way. Similarity maximization aims at co-locating embeddings at the same spot in the embedding space, whereas coincidence prediction is based on a weaker condition. Here we want to have a, a relationship between these embeddings, but not necessarily requiring their co-location. And this is our proposed approach. Um, we first have a, a front end that includes sound separation and augmentation, and we use it to generate pairs of examples. And then a backend with two proxy tasks. So here, first, we decompose an input mixture into two separated channels. And then uh, one of these is randomly selected for each of the tasks. And these go through a data augmentation block. For sound separation, we use a, a model trained with mixture invariant training because it is fully unsupervised and it's been it's shown uh, good results in universal sound separation. Then, as it is typically recommended to use more than one augmentation, we combine sound separation with temporary proximity sampling that has no parameters and a spec augment with default parameters. And then the pairs of examples feed our backend. We have two proxy tasks, similarity maximization we've covered already, and then coincidence prediction is based on the slowness prior of representation learning. The idea here is that waveforms vary pretty quickly, but the semantic perception of them changes very slowly. Uh, so there must be a relatively stable representation able to explain the semantics and hopefully able to support the prediction of coincidence within a temporal proximity. In practice, we extract low dimensional embeddings H, we concatenate them, and then we task this coincidence head to predict whether these two guys coincide within the same clip. And this is a binary classification task, so we use binary cosenter. For evaluation, we use downstream classification with a shallow model. Essentially, we extract features on audio set with a trained encoder, and then we evaluate a shallow network on top of these. And these are the results. We first show the utility of sound separation for contrastive learning. The table shows the performance obtained by creating pairs of examples in different ways. Here, temporal proximity sampling is always applied, and then we apply sound separation and spec augment as specified in this table. So the first row is only temporal proximity sampling, then we apply spec augment and so on. So you can see that sound separation here outperforms spec augment, yet the best performance is obtained by combining both at the bottom. So from these results, we see that comparing input mixtures with the separated channels provide better representations than the conventional setting of using only the input clip. Now, in some previous experiments, we saw that sound separation is beneficial even when the separation is less than perfect. And so we wanted to see um, whether separation model before convergence is also useful for our purposes. Um, so we analyzed a number of separation examples from earlier checkpoints of the same separation model, and this is what we found out. Um, what you're looking at is uh, the spectrograms 
of the two separated channels for four checkpoints of the same separation network. Okay, and then at the top left is the input mixture that corresponds uh, to a guitar melody sound following by the sound of applause. So first here we have S2 separation after convergence and you can see here that the separation is pretty good. This is the model that we used in the previous slide for the experiments. Now we try something new. We have S1 separation before convergence. You can see here the separation is more limited. Then we have a filtering effect in 500 steps. Here the model wants to separate but he hasn't learned how to do so yet. And so the output channels are differently filtered versions of the input. And finally, we have a noise process here with an untrained separation network that reduces a clearly audible and wideband noise. So we wanted to see if these transformations are valid for uh, creating positives for our uh, task. And the results show in the top section of this table that all the processors provide valid forms of augmentation. All of them uh, work on the same ballpark with the noise process working slightly better, surprisingly. And if we focus on the bottom section, uh, you see that um, the combination of some of these uh, processors is also help helpful. Finally, we showed results when we trained the framework entirely, meaning jointly optimizing both proxy tasks. And here we, ob we observe some boosts across the board. So it seems that the key ingredient here is not the quality of the sound separation process, but rather the combination of diverse processing by the separation model as learning progresses. This uh, approach outperforms some past approaches, some of them using uh, also video and text, and is competitive with the state of the art on this task. So the takeaway here, we've seen that sound separation can be seen as a valid augmentation to generate views for contrastive learning, and that learning to associate mixtures with separated channels elicit semantic structure in the representation. Also, we discovered that the transformations provided by different checkpoints of the same separation model as learning progresses uh, provide valid augmentations for generating positives. And finally, jointly optimizing these both proxy tasks is beneficial. This uh, paper received one of the best papers award um, at WASPA. And we now briefly mention our work on DK's challenge organization. Um, this has been published in DK's workshop. So in order to uh, foster research on sound recognition, I, along with other researchers, organized two DK's challenge tasks uh, related to learning with noisy labels. The organization tasks included the design of the problem formulation, development of audio data sets, and the management of the Kaggle platform. Uh, this attracted over 1,000 teams in total on the Kaggle platform. And uh, one of the most important outcomes is the generation of open knowledge. In addition to the data sets and the baselines, there was a lot of exchange uh, in the forums and uh, the code for the top solutions was released. To conclude, the summary and conclusions of this thesis, the technical contributions are a comprehensive review of the sound event recognition field and the different topics covered. The development of FSD50K, which is the largest fully open data set of human labeled sound events. A comprehensive characterization of this data set. Architectural modifications to increase shift invariance in CNNs for audio. The development of FSD18K, which is the first one to provide for the investigation of label noise in sound classification the evaluation and development of techniques to mitigate the effect of label noise during training of sound classifiers and the development of novel self-supervised learning frameworks for learning representations from unlabeled data. In addition, one of our papers received a best paper award at WASPA. I've been a developer of two successful proposals for Google faculty research awards that partially funded my PhD. I've been a technical program co-chair of DK's workshop, also involved in challenge organization in DK's and the recent here challenge. I've been a reviewer for multiple venues, and this thesis led to four data sets and five code repositories. 
Uh, in terms of publications, this work led to three journal articles as a first author, five conference articles as a first author, and seven conference articles through various collaborations. Overall, uh, before this thesis, sound classification uh, was typically based on supervised classification using clean and small data sets. Today, our field has expanded with inclusion of large vocabulary data sets and the progressive consolidation of new directions like learning with noisy labels and self-supervision. This thesis has contributed to this transition uh, by providing data and code resources, as well as state-of-the-art approaches and audio representations. In the future, I'll keep contributing from Google Research. And all of this, I didn't do it alone. I did it with support of many people to whom I'm very grateful. A few of them are in this slide. That's all. Thanks a lot for listening.